So on my Patreon, for $20, you can request a movie to be featured on the show. But there's a little workaround where you might not have to be a $20 patron. See, if you're a patron of mine and you offer to send me the DVD of the movie you want reviewed, I'm inclined to at least look at it. And if you send me DVDs of 60 movies, well, that helps your odds, too. There were some movies, terrible movies, movies so awful, no one would touch. Then came a Matthew, sad little Matthew, Matthew decided these movies to watch. For every good movie, there's at least ten bad. Today's episode, Order of One, Kung Fu Spree Killer. <sighs> Today's episode is brought to you by Travis Anderson, who sent me this box of 60 movies to take a look at one of them. So, um... First, let's address how weird this box set is. So, most of these movies are public domain, which makes physical media of them basically worthless. Not only do I already have a lot of them, but I guarantee most of them I can find on YouTube in higher quality than DVD. But hey, it includes Don't Go in the Basement and Driller Killer, so two more for the Video Nasties pile. It's also a box set of box sets. You get five DVDs with 12 movies each. Four of the five are cheap or public domain movies, but this one features 12 weird, obscure movies I cannot find anywhere else. This is the only official DVD release of most of these movies, and you can only buy them in a pack with 48 public domain movies. So all the movies on this set were released around the same time and have this strange naming convention of title, colon, second title? So, I assumed these must be made by the same person, or at least the same company, but I can't find anything linking them. They just seem to exist. I assumed they were all just bought by the same distributor, and that distributor was the one who came up with the names? And hell, that distributor was probably Mill Creek, the ones who put out this set. It actually seems like most of these films only have one title on IMDb, and the movie in question just calls itself Order of One, no subtitle. So the movie we're looking at today is Order of One, colon, Kung Fu Spree Killer. The box lists it as 2011, and IMDb says the release was in 2011, but somehow it's a 2006 movie? I assume it was just finished in 2006 and sat on a shelf for five years, but it's an odd discrepancy. This DVD alone poses a nearly dingo picture-sized rabbit hole of mystery. This reeks of some creepy pasta setup. A stranger sent me this creepy DVD full of mysterious movies. On the other hand, actually watching the film looks like I got tricked into reviewing someone's home movies. If this didn't come in an official-ish box set, I'd assume Travis and some friends made this just to troll me. But this film was not made by Travis. It was directed and stars Jason Cavalier, a stuntman who worked on some pretty mainstream films. I mean, he was in the X-Men movies. But, uh, this is his only directing gig. And it was written by Kevin Woodhouse, who also mostly does stunts and also plays a main character. Am I afraid I'm gonna set a dangerous precedent of people sending me movies in the hopes that I'll review them? A bit. Am I going ahead with this anyway? Absolutely. You need to see this. This is Order of One, colon, Kung Fu Spree Killer. The film begins with white text on a blank screen explaining the plot. A good sign. It tells of a sword forged from the spear that pierced Jesus' side. Uh, so, before modern carbon dating, there were a lot of people in Jerusalem who would just make up holy artifacts to sell to eccentric Europeans coming for a visit. There's like dozens of nails that were used to nail Jesus to the cross. And then of course you've got weird made up stuff like the Holy Grail. And I think it's really funny that these artifacts persist in our pop culture despite being disproven ages ago. The story proper begins in a diner with this guy with an unplaceable accent. 
Oh, it's not bad. Quiet, though. This guy is doing a voice, right? This, this is not an accent from any part of the world? I can't even understand what he says here. Goddamn rain. Brought down rain? Goddamn rain. Goddamn rape? Got them raid. Got them raid? We meet Ross, a reporter, who we know is a reporter because he approaches a random stranger and goes, Hey, I wrote that article. That was me. I'm a reporter. And the guy just goes with it. Me, I, I wrote that. I'm, I'm a reporter. My name's Paul. Hey, Ross. Ross Conroy. Please meet you, Paul. And these guys come in with Sonny, the titular kung fu spree killer. It's 2 in the morning. Just coffee, thanks. Wait, it's 2 a.m.? And why are there so many people here? The answer, of course, to pad the body count. Which is a very noble goal in my book. Three hippie girls come in, kill Paul, and the camera focuses on this. Haha, <laughs> wonder what that's about. And astoundingly, three girls standing completely still kill nearly everyone in the room without getting shot once. Although the editing is just disorienting enough that it's kind of hard to tell how many people are shooting them without stopping and counting. You got the cook with a shotgun, two secret agent guys who came in with Sonny, a random cop who happened to be there, and this dude who has a gun for some reason. So five people couldn't take down one of three stationary targets, but those stationary targets could hit all five of them. But not Ross running away with the sword of power. Sonny also makes it out and does this. The fuck? I don't even have a joke, just... The fuck? One of the girls gets Sonny at point-blank range, which seems unnecessary, because she could probably kill him through the window without even looking, based on their skills. Yet he manages to get the drop on her, make her boob do a squeaky sound effect... ...several times... ...then shoot her. And as he's stealing a car, Ross runs out and jumps in it. I actually kind of appreciate the stationary car with jittery camera effect. Like, it's kinda obvious what they're doing, but for a no-budget film, that's the best you probably could do. Although, I'd recommend moving the light source. It's like there's one street lamp constantly following them. Turns out the girls work for a Korean martial arts gang, led by Discount Yun Fat Chow. Like, usually that's a joke on someone's appearance, but I'm not convinced this guy wasn't hired for his ballpark resemblance to Yun Fat Chow. Also, my DVD ripper zoomed in on the actual movie, but they put the subtitles below frame, so I can't actually show them to you. Here's what it looks like on a TV, though. Disgusting. And, of course, they're after the sword to return honor to their family. They send a strip club owner who owes Park a lot of money to kill Ross and Sonny and retrieve the sword in exchange for avoiding his debt. Which seems like sort of a losing proposition because, sure, maybe he succeeds, but then you have to forgive his debt, and if he fails, he's probably dead, so he's not going to pay that debt off anyway. Meanwhile, you seem to have a shit ton of guys who I assume would do it for a lot less money, and would have the advantage of strength in numbers. Also, the car Sonny stole was Ross's. Wah, wah. So the strip club guy just hires two other dudes to kill them. Fucking useless. One of them manages to snipe Sonny off the road, but Ross and the sword aren't there. I'm gonna take my time and enjoy this. Specifically to give you time to fight back. Oh no, you fought back! And Sonny builds up enough combos to do Skull Destruction Fist. Again. The fuck? And this guy goes after Ross, who somehow got into the forest with a gun. But he does do this, so... Just don't question it. And they keep ending scenes with this freeze frame on someone's face, color grade, zoom in. Kind of reminds me of something like an NCIS type show would do. This scene has tits. Which is pretty respectable given the budget. There's almost a bell curve to a film's budget versus the likelihood you're gonna see tits. It is a bit steeper on the low budget end, but still. On the one end you've got Hollywood movies, which basically never have nudity in them. If they do, they're gonna be not just R movies, but 
hard R movies. Lots of violence, lots of swearing, and the tiniest bit of titty. Moving into more lower budget studio films, uh, occasionally you'll see films that try to ride off of, hey, we got this popular actress to be topless. Or you'll get sort of machismo-fueled action films that find the most arbitrary reasons to shove nudity in. But then you get to the peak with the low-budget studios, the, the traumas, the full moons, absolutely peaking with the work of Andy Sidaris. Note to self, review another fucking Andy Sidaris movie. I'm sorry it's been so long. But then you sort of get diminishing returns once you hit, like, the no-budget end. Most low, low-budget movies or no-budget movies aren't gonna have the money to pay for a nudity clause. Though maybe these guys just put up the money for real strippers, who knows. Anyway, the strip club guy gets harassed by some guy demanding he pay at least half of his debt. But I thought if he got the sword, he was off the hook. And this guy's business card just says, That Cancun Kid. Badass. Pfft. Overcompensate much? Even Badass Matt's business card just says Space Lumberjack. Although, I guess he has the word badass in his name. And it comes with a built-in self-destruct feature. Hey, other Matt. Yo, what's up? Catch. Uh. I wonder if my neighbors get concerned with the amount of shots and explosions and stabbings that happen in this apartment. Freeze frame, color grade, zoom in. Why does Park want the sword? Let me pull over to the side of the road, wait for you to change outfits, and then give a vague answer. So Paul said that whoever possesses the sword can tap into its unique powers. Also, Sonny changes into fucking Jedi robes? Where did they even get those? Is that just something Ross had in his car? But hey, this clearly very real and not poorly inserted billboard says there's a place with free beer. Don't do it, man. I know free beer sounds good, but if they're handing it out to everyone, it's gonna be the cheapest, shittiest beer ever. Hey, can I comment on how shitty the camera work is? Lots of Dutch angles, too close close-ups. It's the type of thing that reeks of amateurs trying to make their film look interesting. And look, I respect the attempt, but everyone does this, and it always looks bad. Of course, this is the same strip club from earlier, and I guess they just knew Ross and Sonny were coming? How? And if they did know they were coming, why do only three of them show up with guns? I think we should more guns. Yeah, maybe next time. I mean... yeah. Luckily, they're all those infinite bullet guns, so they can just keep shooting forever. Ah! That one makes even less sense. You didn't even kill anyone. And that was Ross. Sonny's the one who's supposed to get bonus moves. Finally, Sonny gets wise and pulls out the Sword of Damocles to fight these guys, and... It gives him a flashback to prison? Other guys, uh... Bitch for me. Oh, I know how to bitch for you. My god, have you seen Ginger Dead Man 3? This movie is so awful. I mean, the fucking comedy just sucks. Sonny was forced to be an illegal fighter by this big boss of the prison. Got it? Good. Cause now he's gonna slice a bunch of motherfuckers down. This was so badass in their heads. So they stop for this nearly topless chick with car problems, and yep, it's the sirens from the beginning. And of course they have to find some wacky way to kill these guys, because they can't just shoot them. They were at least smart enough to take the damn sword while they had the chance. And I know these guys are stuntmen, but mad props for actually getting drugged behind a car. That's dedication. Of course, Sonny escapes and does a flying kung fu kick through a car windshield. 
radical. At last, one of the girls pulls out the Master Sword, and I guess it gives you traumatic flashbacks? Why? I hope you don't do everything that quickly. Why? Who cares how fast he does things? That's something you say to someone before you have sex, not before you try to kill them. Though maybe Sonny took that as an invitation. Haha, <laughs> nope. And then he cuts off Ross's head. And look at this, they do the freeze frame color grade zoom in to go to the exact same scene. And they drive away from this not at all subtle shot. Hmm, wonder what this is about. We learn that Paul, the guy who died 40 minutes ago, got the sword from his uncle, and we get a flashback to his uncle finding it in World War II. Do you care? Do you care? Who cares? It feels like you're over-explaining this. Like, if it tied into the main characters, or if it was just a cool scene, maybe I'd forgive it. But I don't care about this. Of course, the sword is kind of like the One Ring in that whoever wields it refuses to give it up, so Sonny and Ross have a standoff that gets interrupted by this guy. And I guess that's enough for Sonny to just give up the sword. Also, this guy was asking them for a ride, and it's definitely super unsuspicious that he'd approach a guy pointing a gun at a guy holding a sword. So what's his deal? He vanishes from the car. He says they'll meet again, so they're not even hiding that this was a lame setup. He might as well have walked on and said, Hello, my name is Chekhov, and this is my gun. See you later! So Ross and Sonny enjoy some not Budweiser. We, we ripped the labels off, it's not Budweiser. They take the car they stole from the sirens to the shop, where they learned the brake lines were cut? How'd they get this far on cut brake lines? Who cut them, the sirens or someone trying to kill the sirens? But wouldn't you know, this garage is run by Sonny's baddies from the prison and they're doing illegal stuff. So it's okay to kill them and not pay for the car repairs. We're gonna have a little game of charades, all right? Everybody ready? Yeah, okay. Eh? <laughs> I appreciate how some of these guys are clearly not okay with the boss's homophobic joke. Or maybe they just noticed how unfunny and pointless it was. And it's Ross's turn to pick up the sword where he just sees him turning down a police bribe? That's your traumatic backstory? He doesn't even use the damn sword. And this fight goes on and on and on. They're minor characters. This should be over and done with. Save it for the main villains. Oh, and Sonny lands another fatality, complete with x-ray bone shattering. Also, the guy that was getting tortured in this garage was the strip club guy. So he's here now, and he's dead. And then they have a car chase with the sirens, which is amazing considering the production value of this. Although, they seem to be limited to the one road because they keep making U-turns every time they get to the end. This somehow leads to an all-out gunfight between Sonny, Ross, and a bunch of mass goons, I guess working for Mr. Park, and the Cancun Kid, badass, and his gang, who I guess have turned on the Park gang? Like... There was a scene of them going, let's keep the sword for ourselves. But Park's people don't know that yet. And one of their fatalities is making someone spit Szechuan sauce. Now, this fight scene is justifiably long, but so soon after the last super long fight scene makes it kind of blend together, which is not good pacing for an action movie. So the first time I watched this, I somehow missed how the sirens got the sword. Turns out they just opened the car door and took it. You idiots left the Sword of Power in an unlocked car? Ross shoots one of them, giving Sonny a chance to get inside, where he gets a video game overlay, complete with Hot Shots Part Dew style kill counter. Ah, uh, are you really gonna make me go back and count how many kills this guy has? I mean, I did. It's, it's 24. He has 24 kills up to this point, which is about 10% of what they're claiming. Hell, the whole body count for the film is only 52, which, you know, is respectable, but it's not 227. He also somehow has 15 bullets. I mean, at least they admit he has too many bullets unless they're 
really, really tiny. Also, his health bar goes off the top of the screen, and they abandon the first-person view almost immediately. And he gets shot, so this wasn't even like the final conflict. So Sonny and Ross are both shot and bleeding out, so Chekhov's ghost comes and saves Sonny. Not Ross, though. Fuck that guy, I guess. So Sonny makes his way to Park's dojo and kills the shit out of some guys. I feel like he's not really a kung fu spree killer. These mostly seem to be, like, self-defense kills. He and Park's nephew get into a sword fight, and who is in this picture? You think we'll ever get an HD Blu-ray release of this film so we can find out? So Mr. Park touches the Sword of Destiny, and he sees the darkest thing yet. Unrestrained consumerism. And after killing Park Jr. with one more fatality, Park Sr. decides to fight Sonny. Hand to hand. Not with the incredibly powerful sword he just got. Although, Park is pretty good. He knocks him to the ground and then stabs him with the sword. And yet somehow, Sonny gets up and walks out with the sword still in him. How? How did Park not stop him? There is this weird confrontation with a cop from Sonny's backstory we met like five minutes ago. But that goes nowhere. Park just shoots him. So what the hell? How did he escape? Is there a scene missing? Could they just not afford to finish the climax? Anyways, the janitor helps him get the sword out and it's donated to a museum. The end. That's that's how it ends. Ross is dead and Park walks off fine. And there's a boom mic in the second to last shot. Nice. So that's Order of One Kung Fu Spree Killer. I will give this movie one huge piece of praise. They tried. And for that, they have my complete respect. I've reviewed a lot of these tiny, no-budget movies, and while a lot of them are endearing, there's some element of laziness to a lot of them. Not here, though. This is a movie two guys made because they thought it would be super cool, and they put their all into it. That the end product isn't very good shouldn't be a mark of shame. That said, there is a lot to criticize, even outside of how cheap it is. For starters, I hate how ugly this footage looks and the aspect ratio is bullshit. The cinematography needs work, and they somehow got a few good action scenes and a lot of bad ones. Clearly they could do good action, so why is it sometimes so poorly done? Really, the whole visual side of this film needs a punch up. Also the story's kinda hard to follow the first time through, and there's a lot of poorly written bits. Feels like the script could have used one or two more drafts before going to film. But it is fun as hell. Just a crazy, enjoyable throwback to drive-in action movies. If it were slightly easier to get a hold of, I might be more enthusiastic about recommending it. I don't know if it's quite worth putting up for the whole 60 movie box set for this one film, but if you find the Freak Show Cinema set by itself, I say grab this movie and show it to some people. Special thanks again to Travis Anderson for the DVD, or DVDs. Uh, might be revisiting this box set. Uh, if you like this video, The Dragon Lives Again is another weird-ass kung fu movie you might enjoy taking a look at. And, uh, hold on. Giant heel monster, chop and moan, killer fruit. Care of the three. Square root. Holy shit! That's 99 episodes! This isn't a hint about the 100th episode.